Hi, uh, I'm Christine Jacobson. I'm Zooming from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, I'm an assistant curator of modern books and manuscripts at Houghton Library. I'm so sorry to not see you all last year here in Cambridge. I'm sorry to miss you all again this year in Cambridge, but um, have really high hopes for 2022. Uh, the title of my paper is Invisible Labor Made Visible, Women Bibliographers in the Novels of Barbara Pym. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to um, thank the Barbara Pym Society um, for inviting me to give this paper um, and for organizing the virtual conference this year. I also wanted to uh, say that this paper is dedicated to my friend Corinne Wolfson. Um, I believe most women find out about Barbara Pym um, from other excellent women, and I'm so glad Corinne introduced Pym's works to me. Uh, my world has certainly been a little uh, cozier ever since. So early in the novel, No Fond Return of Love, Dulcie Mainwaring wonders aloud if one ever really wants to hear a lecture or if one just submits as it were. Elsewhere in the novel at a conference for discussing scholarly niceties, Dulcie submits to a lecture by Aylwin Forbes titled Some Problems of an Editor. Before he gives his lecture, Aylwin worries about the dryness of his topic. Uh, fortunately for everyone involved, Aylwin doesn't get very far and instead faints on stage creating a stir, uh, not to mention an opportunity for Dulcie to distinguish herself by reviving him with smelling salts. Like Ellen, I worry about submitting you all to my talk today. Um, I may not have the problems of an editor, but let's be frank, the word bibliographer appears in my paper's title. Um, and I have no tension of causing a sensation by fainting. Um, I'm sitting down. I take comfort, however, in the fact that we're here because we enjoy reading Pym's novels, um, which feature characters who work, as Pym puts it, on the dustier fringes of the academic world. In other words, Pym's heroines often work in supportive roles as indexers, proofreaders, librarians, and occasionally as editors, um, but rarely as scholars or authors. These women and their work are the focus of my talk today. So this paper was inspired by a new field of scholarly inquiry called um, critical book history. And just to take a step back, um, book history is a field that emerged in the mid 20th century as the study of the book as an object. Um, its evolution, its formats, its bindings, its paratexts, and so on. Uh, the field of book history has evolved over the past several decades to become increasingly interdisciplinary. These days, it puts in conversation together cultural and social historians, literary scholars and critics, those interested in the theory and practice of editing, bibliographers, paleographers, rare book librarians and conservators, and even anthropologists. Topics in book history today range widely from investigations into publishers' finances, material histories of libraries, merchants and bookseller networks, issues with copyright, and so on. In 2021, um, book history is still considered a relatively new and emerging field, um, but it already has some serious blind spots. From its inception, it has been plagued by uh, an underlying assumption of neutrality, while at the same time privileging um, narratives around men's work. Um, men as printers, men as publishers, men as bibliographers and curators and so on. Uh, Critical book history, like other critical fields, centers those who have been relegated to the margins. Um, and this language of margin and center, of course, comes from Bell Hook's 1984 work, Feminist Theory, From Margin to Center. Um, and picking up from Hooks, scholars who are forging this new field, like Kate Osment, um, have called on the field to look for women on the margins of history. Um, and like me, Osment is particularly interested in women who perform bibliographic labor. And I think here is probably a good place to define what we mean when we talk about bibliography. Um, John Carter in ABC's For Collectors describes bibliography as a word that has two meanings, really. So the first, um, as a list of books for further study, otherwise known as enumerative bibliography. Um, think of Ian's bibliography on nutrition in underdeveloped countries um, in an unsuitable attachment. 
or um, you know, of works consulted by an author, probably a definition most of us are familiar with. Um, the other is the study of books as physical objects um, and the systematic description of books as objects. So for example, a complete descriptive bibliography of Barbara Pym might include a listing of all Pym's works and editions with details about the publishers, first and second printings, reissues, descriptions of the dust jacket, et cetera. Are we feeling like we're on the dusty fringes yet? <laughs> So a typical elbow pad clad professional bibliographer would have historically been employed at a great library like the Bodleian at Oxford or Widener Library at Harvard. Um, Osment challenges us to push past the question of who is a bibliographer and instead ask who does bibliography, um, which helps us to capture women's experiences much more reliably. Um, as others in this field, such as Sarah Werner, have pointed out, um, you know, capital B bibliographers are a small group of scholars heavily indebted to the past, a past when women could barely squeeze through the entrance into Fredson and Bowers classes. And Fredson and Bowers are the sort of forerunners of book history. Uh, she writes, it's a past of male scholars and female typists that still determine how we understand and describe books. Um, and I love that while she's noting this history has been written by men, the women were there and they were doing the labor, um, even if it was just as typist. So right, so women for the most part were not getting PhDs at Oxford and Cambridge in the early mid 20th century. Um, they weren't invited to publish in journals like studies in bibliography, but they were working in libraries. Um, they're working in the offices of prestigious journals, um, like the journal Africa, you know, to pluck an example out of thin air. Um, they're proofreading manuscripts, they're crafting indexes and preparing bibliographies for publication. This is why I like Kate Osmond's question, who does bibliography uh, so much? It allows us to excavate the contributions of women in this discipline, even if they didn't hold a fancy title, um, or even if they didn't consider their work on par with that of their male colleagues. Many of my own colleagues are doing important work in this area. Um, Osmond is not only uncovering the contributions of librarians to book history and descriptive bibliography, she's also pioneering new ways of citing that labor in academic works. Erin uh, McGurl is revealing the marks on movie screenplays left by secretaries and stenographers in the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and Juliana Dresvina has edited a forthcoming book called Thanks for Typing. Um, on the reality of uncredited contributions of wives, daughters, mothers, companions, and female assistants who labored in the shadow of history's famous men. And at the heart of this research uh, is a desire to spotlight these women who have been relegated to the margins and to understand their, the value of their contributions. So for this paper, um, I thought it would be fun to apply Osment's question, who does bibliography, um, to the novels of Barbara Pym. Um, and I'm interested in a wide swath of bibliographic labor, um, librarianship, proofreading, creating bibliographies, and, and preparing indexes. Um, to this end, I've identified a few characters across Pym's novels who fit this description, and I'll be doing um, close readings of how their labor is characterized and what role that labor plays in the novel. So let's talk about librarians. <clears throat> talk little and tread lightly, reads a notice at the Bodleian in Crempton Hodnet. These words certainly describe Ian Broom in An Unsuitable Attachment. Ianth is one of the novel's heroines and a library worker. We don't know her exact title or the name of the library where she works, um, but we do know she decided to take on library work after her father died and that her mother thought it a suitable ladylike position, um, one that would bring her daughter into contact with a refined intellectual type of person. The library where she works is only vaguely described in the novel as containing political and sociological works. Um, but we know it is not a university library because her coworker Mervyn Cantrell is disappointed to have not ended up at the uh, in a university position. 
Barbara Pym mentioned in letters to Philip Larkin that it is rather like the library at the International African Institute, uh, where Pym worked as uh, assistant editor with friend and future literary executor Hazel Holt. Um, so the staff of the fictional library are described as not always appreciating the niceties of setting out a bibliographical entry correctly. Um, Mervyn is Ian's superior and is referred to um, interchangeably as the librarian, the senior librarian. Um, and in our first introduction to him, Mervyn chides Ian for mixing up the publisher, Oxford, with a book's place of publication, London, on one of the library's catalog index cards. We know he also enjoys wielding his position over potential researchers who are only permitted to use the library at his discretion. So that's the sort of mise en scene of the library in an unsuitable attachment. Ian uh, gives few clues about how she relates to her work. Her days pass punctuated by cups of tea. The other characters, meanwhile, are full of opinions about library work. Uh, Mervyn describes the new library position, later filled by John Challow, as a stooge's job, um, while Sophia Anger wonders if anything having to do with card indexes isn't slightly degrading. Veterinarian Edwin Pettigrew disagrees, arguing a card index may be a noble thing, especially if it has to do with animals. Most importantly, however, is the fact that virtually everyone in the novel seems to equate library work with spinsterhood. Uh, the retired Ms. Grimes jokes to Ian, she isn't on the sh off the shelf yet, um, even if you are a librarian. Uh, Miss Grimes' joke implies that most librarians aren't marriageable, even if Ianth is an exception. Um, unfortunately for Ianth, her friends don't afford her even this luxury. Her friend Sophia confides to her, I rather feel that you're one of those women who shouldn't marry. I don't suppose I shall now, said Ianth, but of course one never knows. People do marry quite late in life. I always think that's such a mistake, said Sophia. You seem to me to be somehow destined not to marry. She went on, perhaps too enthusiastically. I think you'll grow into one of those splendid spinsters. Oh, you don't mean it nastily or cattily, um, but who are pillars of the church and whom the church certainly couldn't do without. When Ian's circle finds out she is engaged to be married, they are disappointed uh, and fear that she's acting out of character. Ironically, the fact that her betrothed John Challow works at the library is a feather in his cap. Um, at least he works in a library, Bertha murmured. One does feel that is something. That Edith's friends and colleagues feel this way is not a surprise. Um, in fact, it reflects an attitude that has plagued women since they entered uh, the library field in the mid 19th century. Almost as soon as women got behind the card catalog, male librarians started manufacturing a tension between the two kinds of female librarians. Um, on the one side, the young, pretty woman whose only motivation for working in the library is to be exposed to eligible suitors. Um, these women would soon be married and exit the profession. On the other side, um, a spinster who chooses a career in librarianship over having a family. Um, and both types uh, were seen as a threat to the profession. Uh, Melville Dewey, uh, architect of the Dewey Decimal System, famously complained about this first group um, in an article titled, Women in Libraries, How They Are Handicapped, uh, maligning the serious lack of permanence in these women's plans. Uh, a 1902 Library World article um, had Frank Chennel advising his male colleagues that they really had two options, um, outstrip your lady competitor in efficiency or marry her. By the 20s, um, librarian Maud Best had decided it wasn't such a bad thing that all these women were marrying and leaving the profession, since after all, uh, it weeds out those girls whose distractingly pretty face might be out to disturb the placid serenity befitting the library and its inhabitants. So what does this say about women who stay in the library? Um, in her seminal 1995 article, Left on the Shelf, uh, in the Journal of Library History, Julia Taylor points to this debate as the source for the repressed spinster librarian stereotype. 
Uh, she writes, if women librarians who were married were forced to leave, by extension, those who stayed were constrained to remain single, either by choice or by fate. Uh, and this kind of false dichotomy always brings to mind um, Mary Hatch Bailey for me um, in It's a Wonderful Life. When George Bailey, husband of Mary and, and father of four kids, uh, wishes he had never been born, his guardian angel Clarence shows him a timeline in which he doesn't exist. And so, of course, unable to marry George, Mary Hatch had no choice but to become, you guessed it, a spinster librarian. But Pym, who loves a good spinster, uh, <clears throat> does not destine the library heroine of an unsuitable attachment to spinsterhood. Nor is Ianth a young woman uh, who's quickly whisked off her feet by someone like the refined intellectual her mother had hoped for. Um, instead, Ianth, elegant and middle-aged, who has worked at the library for a number of years, quietly falls in love with her coworker, John Chalo. Um, Chalo is really interesting because he's, he's Ian's inferior professionally as well as socioeconomically. Um, he's also crucially younger than her. In fact, um, it's Chalo who's the young pretty librarian who attracts the attention of a refined older suitor and quickly exits the profession. Um, Ian, for her part, diverges from the manufactured um, marriage versus spinsterhood dichotomy um, she'll marry John Chalo and continue working at the library. Um, and instead it's Chalo who will be forced to leave the library due to Mervyn's poor um, reaction to their engagement. Um, even if Chalo intends, intends to seek worse work elsewhere, it's uh, clear that Ian, um, with the house full of Heppel White chairs um, and her position at the library has more potential to be the principal breadwinner for them. Uh, so Pym, who worked on the dusty fringes of academia herself, couldn't have designed this outcome by accident um, and would have been well aware of the tropes she was overturning in giving Ian such an outcome. Uh, while I interpret this as a deliberately modern move on Pym's part, her publisher didn't see it that way. Um, of course, as we all know, an unsuitable attachment was supposed to be Pym's seventh novel, uh, but her publisher, Jonathan Cape, rejected it in 1963. Uh, like Philip Larkin, who wrote the introduction to the 1982 Macmillan edition, um, I'm frustrated by the little information we have about their reason for rejecting it. Uh, but we know from her correspondence with Larkin that she suspected it didn't reflect the spirit of the decade, that is the 1960s. While the novel contains many of Pym's signature unfashionable trappings, um, a quiet parish community setting, a cast of character that includes a vicar and a nun, an expository dialogue over endless cups of coffee, her, her, um, <clears throat> her publisher failed to appreciate the ways it was also ahead of its time. Taylor points to the 1970s, uh, Taylor, the author of Left on the Shelf, um, points to the 1970s as the first decade librarians finally started to shake off the repressed spinsterhood um, stereotype, uh, in part thanks to the women's lib movement. Uh, but Pym wrote Ian's Have It All ending a full decade before. Um, the world just needed some time to prepare itself. So let's move on to indexing in the novels of Barbara Pym. In 1961, Serial Hugh Jones wrote the following review in The Tatler. Turn of Love by Barbara Pym is a delicious book, refreshing as mint tea, funny and sad, bitchy and tender-hearted about what it is like to be a fading lady in her early 30s living in North London and trying to soothe the niggling pains of disappointed love with hot milky drinks and sensible thinking. Dulcy Mainwaring has a broken engagement, a large dowdy house, a teenage niece, and a cross friend called Viola Dace, uh, who hopelessly loves the glamorous literary figure, Alwyn Forbes. The background is suburban literary fringe life, parish churches, weird seaside hotels, and the polite impingement of people who do not much like each other, but share a common loneliness. 
I love and adore Miss Pym's pussycat wit and profoundly unsoppy kindliness, and we may leave the deeply peculiar face-saving, gently tormented English middle class safely in her hands. <clears throat> is much kinder than the Glasgow Herald's review, which maligned the novel for being set in the vague, dusty world of libraries, catalogs, and research, and for being bedeviled with trivia. What I love about the Herald review is how it skewers Pym for the exact reason Pym's readers love her work. One reader in Hampstead wrote to Pym, I write, feeling a little silly for doing so, to say how much I have enjoyed your book. I am in the middle of a spell of feeling particularly overworked and underappreciated and didn't feel I had a laugh left in me when on Saturday night, I started to read your book in bed. I love to escape from time to time into your world, so don't ever stop writing. There must be thousands of others who feel the same. <clears throat> Perhaps the reader so enjoyed the novel because she saw herself in the characters. Overworked and underappreciated certainly describe Dulcie and Viola, the bookish heroines of the novel. The two first meet at the conference I described in my introduction, one for discussing scholarly niceties, um, such as making bibliographies and indexes and other humdrum tasks as Dulcie describes them. We never learned the name of the conference, but I am sort of intensely curious about whether such conferences for odd academic jobs actually exist. Uh, to center this marginal work uh, seems rather radical and fantastical, especially for the 1960s. Uh, certainly there existed societies such as the Society of Indexers in the United Kingdom um, that met annually, but Dulcie's comment, uh, it's an unusual idea having a conference of people like us, suggests that the conference is um, kind of a, a singular event. And I think it's significant because in setting the first chapters of the novel at such a conference, Pym focuses our attention on this labor, um, usually invisible, here made visible. Not everyone in the novel feels comfortable discussing this labor. Um, it's as if they prefer to keep it invisible. When Viola and Dulcie meet, uh, Viola is immediately allergic to Dulcie's description of their line of work. Uh, Dulcie supposes everyone at the conference does humdrum, thankless tasks for people more brilliant than ourselves. And Viola recoils, stating emphatically, oh, my life isn't at all like that. I've been doing research of my own, and I've already started a novel. Viola is eager to present herself as someone who does work of their own, not, in work, uh, not work in support of someone else. That would be far too dreary. But later she admits that her health broke down while doing a PhD at London University um, and that she in fact did do some work for Aylwin Forbes. Later in the text, we haven't heard anything more about this novel she's writing, but we learn that she is doing the index for Aylwin's latest book. Outrageously, she's not being paid to do this, though Dulcie hopes she'll get some acknowledgement in the foreword. Um, something about your having undertaken the arduous or thankless, though I hope it won't be that, task of compiling the index. Thankless is a word that pops up a lot in this novel. Um, and so it comes as no surprise to learn that the novel's working title was A Thankless Task, uh, which her publishers rightfully rejected for being too unappealing. It comes up again when Dulcie contemplates a joke Ellen has ostensibly made about indexers, though disappointingly, we don't get to hear the joke. People always look on indexers as unintelligent drudges, thought Dulcie, a little indignantly, as she smiled faintly at an old joke he had just trotted out. But a book can be made or marred by its index, and love and devotion are not necessarily the best qualification, she thought remembering the wives and others who undertook what was often acknowledged to be a thankless task. The thanklessness is important. Uh, there's an interesting simmering tension just below the surface of this novel. Um, you know, despite their protestations that their work is degrading, unimportant, or humdrum, the women in this novel clearly take pride and even intellectual satisfaction in their work and they resent that this work goes unacknowledged or undervalued, as we see in Dulcie's inner dialogue about books being made or marred. 
The simmering pot boils over at the novel's romantic climax when Elwyn calls Dulcie up, having realized he's in love with her and asks if she'll help him with a piece of work. An index Dulcie managed to bring out? Well, not exactly. He sounded so vague that Dulcie said rather sharply, surely an index either is or isn't. <laughs> this hysterical scene calls to mind um, Mildred Lansbury in Excellent Women, uh, who wonders whether any man is worth this burden when she agrees to proof and create an index for Everard Bone's latest book. Mildred cuts to the crux of the issue with that line. Um, she must contemplate this question because neither Everard or any of the men in Pym's novels are offering compensation for this work. Instead, they're offering the allure of associating with their academic clamor, or if the woman is lucky, the promise of love or companionship. These unsuitable arrangements are made again and again between Ellen and Viola, then Ellen and Dulcie, Everard and Mildred, and even Francis Cleveland of Crampton Hodnett and his, and his endless supply of female students who help him with his book. 20 years in the making, by the way. Barbara Pym makes a joke about how it's really uh, odd that it isn't finished yet. Interestingly, this attitude among Pym's male protagonists, um, uh, that is that they can just get the women in their life to do this work, uh, is a reflection of a relatively thin slice in time. Um, in an accidental, in accidental indexer, um, Nan Badgett explains that for centuries, writers and scholars supplied their own indexes, or occasionally printers would do this work. The advent of the professional indexer as a role separate from a book's author takes place in the 18th century, but was predominantly male. It wasn't until the 19th century that women began doing this work, um, usually by virtue of being the wife of an author who needed an index. This practice of informal indexing starts to wane in the mid 20th century as more women enter the profession as a result of formal training and not by happenstance. Um, by the way, according to information collected by Badgett for her book, um, roughly 90% of indexers in the United States today are women. I was just, I was astonished by that. So there's a very good reason the tension around these odd jobs in uh, Pym's novels is so palpable. Um, those jobs had been done for pay by men not that long ago, uh, and women are on the cusp of gaining that privilege too. Um, so I'll just end with some concluding marks about Pym and bibliographic labor. By the time an unsuitable attachment was rejected by Jonathan Cape in 1963, Pym had been a novelist for over 10 years. Now, suddenly, she was not. She confided in her friend Phil Flarkin, it ought to be enough for anybody to be the assistant editor of Africa, especially when the editor is away lecturing for six months at Harvard but I find it isn't quite. Pym worked at the International Africa Institute for nearly 30 years and edited over a hundred issues of the prestigious journal devoted to the study of African societies and culture. As Yvonne Cocking revealed in Barbara in the Bodleian, Pym absorbed fodder for her novels from the bibliographic labor around her in the IAI office, particularly drawing on her interactions with the editorial staff librarians, and itinerant eccentric proofreaders. While it was clearly painful for Pym to lose her identity as a novelist, I'd like to believe that her tender portrayals of the dusty academic fringes suggest she was happy working in that sphere. As I bring this paper to a close, I can't help but think of all the bibliographic labor I've left out, um, not just from Pym's novels, but from her circle in real life. I'm thinking about Hilary Pym's work, gathering her sister's papers together for donation to the Bodleian, Yvonne Cocking's work at the, as the archivist for the Barbara Pym Society, Hazel Holt's instrumental work editing and preparing Pym's manuscripts for publication, and even Jacqueline Schumann's work designing the wonderful dust jackets for the E.P. Dutton editions. I'll just have to save their stories for a future meeting. Um, to end and to demonstrate the power of a good index, I thought I'd read my favorite parts from Barbara's own entry um, in A Lot to Ask, A Life of Barbara Pym by Hazel Holt. Pym, 
Kim, comma, Barbara Mary Crampton. Early life, six, pages six through 12. Writes first novel, 16 to 20. Oxford, comma, falling in love, 21 to 25. Calls herself Sandra, 28. Pursuit of Lorenzo, 36 to 50. Goes to Poland to teach English, 81 to 85. Decides to join the WRNS, 116. Posted to Naples, 127 to 132. Joins International African Institute, 139 to 143. Revises some tame gazelle and it is accepted by Cape, 143 to 145. Meets Hazel Holt and shares office with her, 157 to 160. Excellent Women published, 160 to 161. Obsession with Denton Welch, 172 to 174. Saga of Bear and Squirrel, 175 to 179. First letter from Philip Larkin, 188. In hospital for mastectomy, 228 to 230. Has slight stroke and is in hospital, 240 to 241. Retires from the IAI, 241 to 242. Meets Larkin for the first time in Oxford, 243 to 244. Times Literary Supplement publishes list of underrated writers. She is named twice, 251. Macmillan accepts Quartet in Autumn, 252. Quartet is published and shortlisted for Booker Prize, 258 to 260. Feels unwell, test diagnosed spread of cancer, 271. Recovers for a time and finishes A Few Green Leaves, 274. Appreciation of her novels in USA, 275 to 276. Ill and confined to bed, 277. Goes into Michael Sobel House Hospice in Oxford, 279. Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to the discussion on um, the afternoon of March 20th.